first, I'd like to explain how I ended up here. I was playing a golf tournament I was invited to. It was a, it was super cool. I was uh, just, high end, but, high end golf tournament. But I was excited <laughs> to just be invited. Elite golf tournament and me. And so there's like seven people on a green, and I see somebody holding court. And all the people are like laughing, ha, 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 this guy's holding court. And, and there's like a little crease, and I see it's Steve Young in the crease. Whole, and everybody is listening to every word, every breath he's saying. And I'm like, I love Steve Young. I, I'm left-handed. When I was a kid, I would watch you play and think, oh, th- 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 this is the root. <laughs> I'm leaning closer now. Yeah, this is left- the root. Because <laughs> it's very rare. Yeah, I was a left-handed quarterback. Very rare. And I was like, Steve Young, if I he can do it. I did not realize that. So I walk up, and I get into the crowd of people, and they're all laughing. I don't know what you're saying, but I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> everybody fades away. And I say, hello, Mr. Steve Young. My name is Bobby. I just want to say I'm a big fan. And then I started to walk away, and you – said, I know who you are, and my life changed. Well, no, because um, strangely, my two girls are in high school that were still at that point were like 8th and 10th grade, so I was driving them everywhere, and every morning I'm carpool. And Bobby Bones Joe, and they they love country music. And I always loved it kind of quietly, but then when my kids, I'm like, oh, this is amazing. And so listen to you every morning. And so I wanted, I went home and I said, girls, Lila, so guess, who, guess who I met? Bobby Bones. And then, it was, and then I think you mentioned me somewhere uh, randomly. No, on the show. Randomly, I... we were driving and it's like, my girls are like, he just said your name. True. So it works in a strange circle. But to finish the story though, to really like people need to know this. So it's an elite kind of golf invite to go to the AT&T. And Bobby was there. And it was all set to go. And it was like, you play Thursday and Friday, and then you make the cut or not, or whatever. So it's Wednesday. <laughs> this is when we met on Wednesday. And, like, I go Thursday to kind of tell him, I told him, I rem- you know, something I remember to finish on the, the show. Story. Yeah, yeah. And, and he's gone. Mm. Like, he big time it. No, oh, no, the, I had to gra- work. The, I had no, to no, work. No, 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 no. <laughs> the Grammys called. And it's like, oh, sorry, elite people, <laughs> I'm out of here. I've never seen that done by anybody who's ever been invited to the 18 in my life. Ever that you just show up and it's like see ya and like even people who have been like presidential campaign like, <laughs> like, like nobody says see ya to the AT&T except for the great say Bobby Bones. See ya. So then what happens is we're talking about like for me it was like the fight. Eddie- yeah, he's trying to backpedal. Don't let him go. I mean, I see Steve from your perspective. He did big time AT and T Pebble big Beach. Day, I, I don't think so at all. I want to shout out to everybody at AT and T and Pebble Beach and every Pebble and every beach. But what really happened? I love you all. Um, you had to go work. So regardless, I'm on the air, and the question was because I have a job, much like yours, where we've been able to meet a lot of cool people, um, a lot of famous people, and that doesn't always mix. Some famous people are cool, some aren't. Some cool people are famous, some are. And they're like, who were like the coolest famous people you met? And I had listed, uh, I loved Counting Crows, Adam Duritz. And Adam, I went, he's I went, cool. I went through the list of my top five, and you were on my top five of the coolest. I couldn't believe that. My kids thought I, honestly, they don't know what I did before. And they think I'm kind of like boring and like, <laughs> sad. and when you said my name's the top five, my kids like, whoa, dad. Well, that that's very amazing. nice of you. So, to Bobby, say. thank you for putting me uh, on the pedestal at home. I, I get a te- and then I get a text from an unknown number, and I'm like, "Oh, my stalker's back." I'm thinking it was that, that, and it was, and it was Steve. And the first thing he says is, "I remember the bit I was talking about." How did you get my number? I'm glad you did, but that feels like I, you. I think you gave it to me that brief moment. No chance, because I would never afford. I would never have said, "I think you would want my number." There's no chance. I would have been too insecure to even offer my number. Well, that's a really good point. Who, when you said my name top five, and I said, "Okay, I've got to reach out to him." It was like anybody with who the, the, did the, the I golf go tournament? to? I might have gone to Steve John at the Beach. I think that's what I did. Who I did not big time. I love Steve John. Steve John, shout out. <laughs> he heroic to me. He is heroic, and that's how we are here. I do want to start though because I have taken a crash course in Forever Young, which is your. I your, appreciate that your charity. Yeah. And there are a couple of things that I would like to talk about. First of all, um, I know. Your wife, Barb, and how, the music component of it. Yeah, we did that. Yes, uh, this weekend, Monday, we opened up our ninth one at renowned Children's Hospital in Reno. So, it's uh, it's music. Would you explain? Uh, do you know that? music therapy? I, I've done it so forever. Music therapy is I... crazy. Like I'm not a musician. I only dream. I would, if you guys could, 
I, I wish I could help the raging idiots. Raging idiots? <laughs> raging we need idiots. a lot of help. Yeah, so please. I wish I could do anything. I, if I could sing, I would give up everything. I would give up all. But I love, as everyone does, they love music. My wife, uh, when she was in college, a friend of hers got in a terrible car accident, terrible brain injury. She did the research, which is my wife's way of to kind of like, and she figured out that there's this thing called music, the music therapy. And she went and played Bon Jovi because that was her favorite band, like over, like just all the time in the, in the room. And she believed it's changed. It, it helped. And no one else was like, you know, whatever. That doesn't make any sense. So then 20 years later, um, a dear friend of ours that I grew up with daughter who was 17 a musician and she was down in LA recording. She was a, she was going to be a star. She passed away like out of like just on a hike at a girl's camp. And, uh, and so it was a year anniversary of that tragedy that Barb's like, wait a second, we need to honor her. Cause she would go to the children's, she would go to the children's hospital nearby and play for the kids as a seventy year old. You know, like just, I want to help. I want to do things. So we started Sophie's place, the name of Sophie for music therapy. And at the time in 2000, Six, music therapy in hospitals was starting. They used to have a cart, and the and the music therapist would go around to room to room, and it's like, no, we need a space. And so we went to hospitals and said, look, we'll we'll build the space, and let's fund it with the uh, the music therapist. Music therapy is crazy because music is the only thing that crosses over the both sides of the brain. Language doesn't do that, and so the the music is ends up to be a scientific medicine. Like there's specific things that you can do in motion for beating a drum uh, or or pain or because pain and music travel the same places. And so if there's music, it can't be as much pain. And so there's all the, you know, there's hundreds of prescriptions written every day by doctors for the music therapists for specific things for medicine, for the healing of kids in children's hospitals. So that's that's that. And uh, I wish I was a musician. We had uh, Dan Reynolds came in the Imagine Dragons. We had uh, uh, Chester Bennington. Uh, Lincoln Park. Lincoln Park before. We had, uh, we've had a number of people come through and uh, play for the kids. And so I encourage it. Raging Idiots, pick up Children's Hospital. Oh Let's goodness. go. Let's go. I used to, So I used to be on the board of a similar group called Musicians on Call. And we would go, and especially with older, like 80s and 90s who were in the hospital and it was right. there. Uh, we would learn songs from when they were young, and it would be the only time that you would see them light up. Mm. Like there would be, an, because if they didn't remember, whatever they didn't remember, what they would remember is how they felt when that music was played when they were a kid, oh, and it was like that it. even briefly. It. So it's not, we know that music has that effect, but I think I just want to make sure that people understand that there's a science to the specific things that music, like brain injuries, pe they can't get kids to move their arms, but if they, they can beat a drum mm -hmm. for some reason. So they beat a drum and they use that as they beat the drum to t reteach them how to eat. And so there's just, music has this Amazing. strange power over, and Chester Bennington is the one that told me, he says, they haven't figured out where, where uh, music starts in the brain. And he says, that's because that's where God sits. And no one will ever actually find it. So I, saw, I remember Chester telling me. Love that. that. I went and looked up uh, the charity on the. There's a website you can go see if a charity's legit. You guys got 100. percent I was worried. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. I was like, oh man, do I even want to go look at this? And I could went. Be, could be a scam. And it was. Could and be a scam. I will say it with full authority. It is not. I got all the stars and it was 100. percent Yeah. So uh, charity navigator. We, we're one of the that's, top yeah, ones. Like, that's what we, it was. Thank goodness. I'm we fight for it. it. No, we're 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 a little we're a little group. We're not big. We, we, we pack away it every year. We trade in uh, all this memorabilia for our golf tournaments to raise the money. And uh, we just, we find like-minded people and do our little, our garden in our little corner of the world and try to do something good. Let's talk sports a little bit. Oh, I want to show you because this to me, let me see that in my pocket. I brought, are you going to show me your MVP trophy from last week? Here's no, I couldn't, I couldn't. Well, look what I have in my no, pocket. Oh, yeah. It was a belt. Could, it was a really nice belt. I couldn't see. travel with it, but. I haven't even opened these, but these are cards from like 1990. These are pro line. These oh, are the have, weirdest. Oh yeah, yeah. These are the weirdest cards I've why, ever why? seen. These are the ones with because the some like guys have to, don't have their shirt on. I wanted to roll through some of these cards. Your card actually wasn't that weird. <laughs> I put this in. Do you remember this? Do you remember I this do, picture I, at all? I do, but 
that's amazing that there's some with no. I, yeah, I don't no, remember it's that. It's odd. So, so what I wanted to do was roll through some of these cards that I have not opened yet. Is this a magic trick? I wish. <laughs> That'd be cool. <sighs> Can't open it. Here, do you want me to do it? Well, I don't want to rip it. There we go. And if I pull up a player that you remember, yeah. And if you have a story about that player, okay, let's do it. I would like to hear it. Yeah, but there's a lot of stories I can't tell. Well, then don't tell those. <laughs> All right, okay, good. <laughs> or tell it. Well, the, hey, the mics are off. I know, yeah, right. Yeah. You, you'll... Okay, let's start with Bobby Brister. <laughs> but he, he already knew who it was. Bobby Brister. <laughs> what? So some people like it's what's fun. The league. The NFL is full of just characters, right, from everywhere. And if I remember, Bobby was, like, not Cajun like uh, Bobby Hebert. Because Bobby Hebert played for the Saints. When you met Bobby Hebert, he's like, he would speak English, but Cajun English. And I'd be like, hey, bro, I, I don't know what you're doing. I don't know what you're saying. <laughs> and so then I thought, okay, you're in the Superdome. And 70,000, 80,000 people are screaming, and you're in the huddle, and Bobby Aber's calling the play? <laughs> I'd be like, bro, I don't know what you're saying. Because does everyone else speak Cajun? No, no, they don't. So there's all these – and Bobby Brister is that kind of a character. He's, my, my memory is that he was from the South, and uh, he was a country – like, I can see Bubby growing up in a place where, you know, all the songs are with the dirt road and the fish and, uh, you know, and, um, you know, know, all the great lyrics. I'm just Pick up trust. screwing up right now. But, uh, and that's what, Bu- Bubby's a, Bubby is a country dude. Do you recognize that guy? <laughs> this would be a guy, Pierce Holt, defensive end. <laughs> Do you play with him? Yeah, I did. Pierce Holt. That does That's the most serious thing I've ever seen of Pierce Holt. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! Look, he's looking off in the distance. Like all I'm, of them. Uh, they're like all of them are kind of weird. Like, like I'm George one. Washington crossing the Delaware. Yes. Like, uh, yes. I'm yes. looking for something really important. He never. He never found anything important. I can promise you that. <laughs> Pierce is a good dude. But that's the other thing about guys in the NFL is that these good dudes that are like really kind-hearted. Pierce is a kind-hearted guy. Very. Soft spoken, but was like massive. Like if he walked in the room, you're like, "Hey, whoa, stay there." And he was so big and strong. And then you go play, and you're like, "Holy crap!" There is like two sides to people. Because Pierce had two sides. He was most of the time kind, yeah. peaceful. And then you go play, and you're like, "That dude is different." I think, and you probably have a version of this as well. For me, I'm on all the time if I am performing on stage, doing a radio show or a TV show. But when I'm not on, I'm off. Meaning, I'm very really? quiet. I'm a wallflower. I don't have much to say because all I do is say, and I'm, I'm yeah, supposed I know to mean. have opinions it's constantly. Like otherwise, otherwise, you couldn't be you all the time. I would have no would have, no energy, you, you no juice. Do it. No, it was just it would be. I get that. I get that. Yeah. So I would say that would be my two. Do you two have two versions. sides, like uh, off and on? I mean, no, I'm kind of me. You're always off. all the time. No, I'm on. I mean, well, when Bobby's talking, because when we're on, Steve, he's always talking. <laughs> I know. So we just let him talk. Yeah. Here's, and you don't have to comment on this guy, but see, how he has no shirt on in this picture. Oh yeah, look at that. These Does are it, like glamour he's got a little shots. Little belly. Yeah. These are, <laughs> these are like glamour shots. Wait, who is that? Oh, Greg Townsend. Okay, oh, how about yeah. a, let's do a coach here. <laughs> There's another George Washington across the Delaware. That's he's the he's the Cajun coach, right? Jim Mora. Yeah, Saints. Playoffs. You know that's that true, soon, right? Remember? I do. Yeah. All right, let's do one more. Did you have another one, Eddie? You see Matt Millen in there? I, oh, oh, oh yeah. so wait, Matt Millen. Yeah, Matt. Good Millen. friend of mine played for the Raiders for a long time. Joined the 49ers. and uh, it, it, he he would have us. Harris Barton was my, we were roommates, so we we hung together, and um, and Matt would invite us because we we're single you know, for dinner for the family, and he'd say, "Look, uh, six fifteen, and so but don't don't come late early, just be there six fifteen. So we would kind of wait in the, around the corner until six fifteen because we didn't want to mess up. So we'd pull in, and then he'd open the door and he'd be in his underwear, <laughs> and he'd be like, "Yeah, come in." And the kids would be all around the table, and we go in and eat. And, he, and he's like, "Eat, you know." <laughs> and so we would eat, and then he would like we'd finish. He's like, "Okay, now leave." And so we would leave. <laughs> it was the greatest. It was the greatest invite you could ever have to come to somebody's house because you don't have to say anything. You just got to be on time, 
You don't look at the underwear and just go in and <laughs> eat dream. and eat and leave. Yeah, that's a dream. Like literally encouraged to leave as fast as you can. And we'd be full. Pat would make tremendous food. And we'd walk out like, this is amazing. Like, this is the greatest thing ever. And the first time I ever met Matt Mellon, he was playing for the Raiders, linebacker. And I was a rookie. And I was in the league, like, you know, and I'm playing the Raiders. And, and I'm, you know, you can imagine, like, you break the huddle and you're like, and Matt Mellon's like, Alert, 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 Mormon in the backfield. Mormon in the backfield. Alert, alert. I'm like, I'm looking around, what is he talking about? And I, I, uh, I, that threw me for a long time. And Matt and I have laughed about that forever, but he was the kind of guy that would uh, do stupid stuff like that. When you, when you leave BYU and you go to the USFL, you, you put a year there. What, what was that even like? USFL was amazing. Um, it was, like the NFL was been around forever. This is an upstart league. Young, most of us were 21, 20, 20, 22 years old. We were living in LA. We were being coached by John Hadle, who was famous kind of quarterback back in the day. And Sid Gilman, one of the, he was old at that time, but he was the f- godfather of the forward passing. Like I, and it was amazing. And I had Gary Zimmerman who ended up being a university of Oregon where you guys just, just were, he was ended up being a hall of fame player. We had Jojo Townsell. We had all these young players. It was a lot of fun. We, we had a great time, and the league was l- legit football. It was why, legit why did you, football. Why did you go to the USFL, though? Because I could play right away, and I was going to be drafted number one by the Bengals, and I didn't – this is this sounds a little weird, but I didn't know anyone in Cincinnati. Wow. <laughs> I knew people in L.A. <laughs> you know what I mean? There's, when you're young, you're like uh, – the familiarity and, uh, and playing. Like, I didn't want to sit and watch. And I, I wanted to go play, and uh, – Sitting next to you makes you talk like you. Did you notice that? I don't know if I... I, I feel like I'm talking like you, sitting next <laughs> to you. So I think there's some hybrid of conversation here where... It's very weird. We we talked to another uh, a player. He, he quarterbacked USC and he was drafted in the top five. Same thing, went to Cincinnati and was like, I don't know what's going on. Oh, yeah. He never watched it on TV. They he, he was like, I don't know what happens in Cincinnati. Right. Well, it's like when you're a kid, there's all kind of weird things going through your head. And with things that you think matter or don't matter, um, uh, all of a sudden... You're, you know, you're getting paid to play a game. Like, if, like I played football in high school, and now I'm getting paid to do it. It's weird. And then everyone else gets paid for it. And then it's like, then you see the older guys who are like, "This is my career. This is how I feed my family." And like, I'm gonna kill you. And you're like, <laughs> "Oh, this is a whole different thing." Like the NFL beats, it runs people out. And you, if you are not careful and you don't really love it, and you're not willing to kind of battle back. You've seen famous, like, high draft picks come into the league, and then three or four years, they just disappear because they just – it's not their passion. It's they, They're really good at it. They're amazing. They're the best athletes in their town, in their county, in their state, at a high college, best athletes anyone ever seen. So you keep doing it. And then finally, the pro game forces you to say, do I love this? And a lot of times, like, I don't. And uh, – that's what happens. Did you realize in your first year with USFL that you probably weren't going to be there the next year? No, we. I believed it was a league that was going to stick around. It, it was. It was in. Now and they might have had to pair back. They had, you know, there's some financial things that would be careful. Of, but it was done. It was. A, it was cooked. And um, then they wanted to go to the fall and go up against the NFL and pfft, into the ground. Um, and it was too bad because the football I played for the LA Express was better than the football. That was in the Tampa Bay Buccaneers that I joined the next year, and um, so it's it's too bad. It should be still here. It should be played in the spring, and they're still trying. It's been thirty years later. They're still trying to do what what they had at the moment, and it just didn't work out. When you go to Tampa, did you have expectations of playing immediately? What was, and did they redraft? How, how did you end up? At so Tampa? when all of us that you know Herschel Walker and Reggie White and. Gary Zimmerman and all these guys, we all left undrafted essentially because we went to the USFL. The league didn't want to allow that. Like, hey, wait a second. Because we all thought, let's go to the USFL, let's play some ball, and if something happens, we'll come back as free agents and we'll pick a team. And the league's like, mm, no, we're not. And so about a year in, they said they made a deal with the Players Association, which I'm still pissed at about the Players Association allowing that because you'd think they would protect us. But they had a, what they called a supplemental draft, and that's when I was number one to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. How did you feel about going to Tampa? Not like I mean, there wasn't a lot of success there. 
look, I, look, I'm, you know, you, 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 I'm not somebody that's going to go, oh, I can only play here or there. I need this or that. I was like, let's go. Um, it was hard. Um, there were some bad boys down there. Um, James Wilder was a running back. He's the toughest human being I ever met. There were some good players down there. It was just a bad situation. It was, you ever been, it's like any organization when, uh, when you know there's no accountability and all there is is mitigation and pointer. Well, oh, if, I would have been great if, but you and you know, and that feeds on itself. And pretty soon everyone's whispering in the corner and Toxic the coaches are trying, generally. Oh, it's yeah. terrible. And everyone's just, and it you can't get out of it. It's like you can't. And then there's fight. You know, fight in the locker room. I remember the first time I went in the locker room in Tampa at the halftime. I go to the halftime and you're waiting for like tips from the coach. You know, like and, <laughs> and half the team's like smoking. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm like, you can't, you can't smoke in the NFL. You can't. What is this? I never forgot that, man. <laughs> How did you negotiate the trade to San Francisco? Then did you let them know you wanted to go? So I, we we were so bad that I played one full year. We were so bad that we were going to have the first draft choice again. And uh, they got a new coach, Ray Perkins, and Ray Perkins shows up and says to me, "See, one thing I want you to know: I hate scramblers." Mm. And I hate lefties. And I'm like, whew, <laughs> this is bad. And, uh, and they had the number one choice, so they took Vinny Tisseverdi, and I was like, okay, we got to get rid of him. So they treated me to the St. Louis Cardinals, which were equally bad. And I had made a, re a relationship with the owner, Hugh Culverhouse. Like, no one talked to Mr. Culverhouse, but I saw him, and he's, like, over in the corner. I'm like, I'll go talk to him, like you would. And um, so we made a and, – and, and that relationship – was one where, you know, he said, you know, Steve, I really love your style. And I love what you're doing, and I want you to be my quarterback for life. I remember him telling me that. So then when Ray Perkins said, oh, bro, you're out, I, and you're traded to the St. Louis Cardinals, I called Mr. Culverhaus. I said, Mr. Culverhaus, you told me you're, I was your quarterback for life. And he goes, oh, I know, Steve. You know, he's got a Southern drawl, you know. I, I, I love you, and I but the new coach, and I don't know. And I go, well, you can't send me to – you got to let me go somewhere where I can thrive. He goes, oh, let me think about it. And he goes, he calls me back. He says, I canceled that trade, and now you have a week. I want you to find a place that you like. Oh. That, who would, that's unheard of in sports, right? And and Ray Perkins was pissed. He was like, <laughs> like because he they had a number of draft choice. They got a number one draft choice, whatever they got from it. And he was dump. Uh, he couldn't wait to dump me around. So then I, they nixed that, and I, that's when Bill Walsh called and said that Joe Montana's had his second back surgery. I think you're amazing. I was like, that's amazing. Great. And uh, that's how that happened. How was the Joe Montana situation? Oh, come on. You want to spend a 45 <laughs> minutes? It was awkward. It was always <laughs> awkward. And, and Joe, if Joe walked in right now, he'd both, we'd both be like, Hey, <laughs> because we didn't, I would tell you that we never fought. We never had a crossword, never supported each other in the ways that we had to, the, the job was the job, right? Um, played golf together, laughed with Steve Bono and, and all the guys like, but it was always awkward because in his mind, I was brought in to take his job. And in my mind, I was brought in because he was hurt and I, I didn't want to sit and watch I wouldn't have, if he was going to go be MVP and win Super Bowls, I'd be like, I love watching him, but I'm going to go play somewhere. So the whole thing was just, and Bill Walsh was the one who was like, oh, it'll work out, you know, it'll be fine. And we both hated him for it, but loved him because we, and I would say this at the end of the day, it got, it got the most out of both of us being together. And he, I watched him play football that is like most amazing football I've ever seen. And then I hopefully played football that, you know, was the most, it was the best I could ever be, you know? And so in that way, it was, it sucked and it was great and it was awkward. And we, the 18, someone did a commercial recently um, that we did with Bo Jackson coming to Bo's house for the super, for the big game. And, and uh, I'm there and, and Joe walks in and Bo says, oh, Joe, th good, good, th that's great. You came. Steve, it's okay, right? <laughs> and, uh, and then I said, I'm okay, of course. And then there's this awkward <laughs> interchange where we try to high five and miss. And then finally we do this kind of claw shake, you know, and it's like awkward. And it's like perfectly, you know, exemplified what 
what the relationship was like. Did you feel like you were a bit ahead of your time in the NFL then because you ran? A thousand percent. I was, well, I got kicked out of Tampa because I was weird. And my game was not the game. I believe that my game was the best game you could have when you have lots of options. You don't have to sit there and wait. I always thought that Tom Brady and Peyton Manning and Dan Marino were like super gods because they had to just stand there. And they were amazing. That's like, I would never want to do that job. But now, 20 years later, because of rule changes, the game is so wide open, you have to run. All the first round draft choices for quarterbacks are all guys that can move around and run. And so the game, strangely, is my game. It's like the game that I, like, I watch it. I'm like, oh, <laughs> so more the love. The love is there. Let me, please let me in, you know? And I keep working out and trying to throw in the backyard just in case. Like, you never know. Like, if 32 guys got sick, maybe <laughs> yeah, I get to throw, up, up, call throw, awesome. throw a couple. <laughs> because you sit in the – look, think about the game today. And Tom Brady said this, so I, it, it makes it true to me that the game today is – uh, the middle of the field is unpatrolled where it used to be like a death zone. Like there's, there's just people running around free. The flats are always open. Just if you need a completion, just take it. And you, no one can hit you. Like it's a dream. It's a quarterback's dream. Oh, by the way, you get paid $60 million a year. It's like a dream. Like, you know, anyway, go on. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not bitter. It's not my, it's not a, it's not a get off my lawn kind of thing. Okay, okay, okay. I know you're thinking you that. Like, like, hey, old man, yeah, get yeah, off yeah. my lawn. No, yeah, it's yeah. more of a appreciation for the changes that have come to me that make me, that resonate and make me want to play again. Who did you fear on the other side of the line? I always say uh, the unblocked guy. You know what I mean? Like that's where you could really get hurt. So he's like, I don't care if it's you guys. And was if that you, up to you guys? But was you, it up to you to find who was going to be the unblocked guy? It was part, partly me and part was just mistakes. Yeah. And you get hit from, you know, and and the, and that back then, the the job was to put you out of the game. That was the job. And people remember the bounty and all this yeah. stuff. Like there's, that was very common. And so you had the best athletes in the world, not the smartest, but the best athletes in the world paid lots of money to come kill you. And um, so you, I, I feared anyone that wasn't blocked. But if you want to say who I f didn't want to see, it was Reggie White. And it, did you know, did you were old enough to know, remember Reggie White yeah, playing? Yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. You know, his football card said uh, Reggie White, Tennessee, 6'6", uh, 320. And you guys have to know that when you're a rookie, you you list, you they give you a piece of paper, card companies, and you say who you are, Steve Young, BYU 6'2", 210. So forevermore, if you look on the card, it's going to say 6'2", 210 because I wrote it down. Now, am I 6'2"? This might be slightly aspirational, but <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like you you write down what you feel you are, right? And if I just thought about Reggie White. He wrote down 6'6", 320. If you write down 320, 340, you're 400. Yeah, yeah 340. <laughs> you know you are. If you were 320, you'd write down 280. Right? Do you understand that? I probably? do. Yeah, yeah. So Reggie was the biggest, most amazing athlete that ever lived. I, I never, I, 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 I didn't meet uh, um, uh, biblical, you know, uh, stone throwing gargantuan. You know, what I mean, I didn't, I didn't meet, you know. But Reggie White was the. You walk, if he walked in today, you'd be like, oh. Uh, uh, but he was a oh. pastor, right? Wasn't he full of love? So. One of the great athletes in the world because uh, uh, he would he was loud, so when he played he would scream, so like rah, you know what I mean like he would so you could hear him, so you like you drop back to pass and he's like here's this we put three guys on him like Reggie three guys and then he'd throw him out of the way you know rah! <laughs> and then you'd hear him coming you're like ah! and you're like ah oh, no here it comes. <laughs> Everyone screaming. So then all of a sudden he's there, right? All of a sudden he's there, and he's, he's he's on you, right? And the most amazing thing is he would grab me, he would turn over and fall backwards. Ah, uh, that's nice. And let me fall on top of him. Mm. And then he would hold on. And there was like this awkward moment. He's like, <laughs> you know? And he'd be like, Steve, how you doing? <laughs> I'm like, not so good. <laughs> Reggie, not so good. You put your dad's here? Because my dad helped him find a, my dad's a lawyer, he found him find, when we, we were, went to the rookie, when we were seniors in college, we went to the all-star game together and we got to be friends. So Reggie, 
would play and he would want to catch up. So he would like, ah, so like intense and like, uh, he'd have you. And then he'd like, hey, so, uh, you know, how's everything going? You know, I'm like, you, you, are you married? You know, it's like, like, what? like so, and I'm like, Reggie, freaking, let's just talk after, right? Talk later. Like, let's not, I don't want to meet like this anymore. This is not appropriate, you know? And that's Reggie. Reggie is the greatest athlete because he was an, you'll appreciate this, Bobby. He was an emotional athlete. He could be an incredible competitor and he could be an incredible friend like that. That's hard to do. Most of the friends that I played against went the other way. It was worse, right? They were, I know you, you know, they just don't know how to handle the, the athleticism and the emotional athleticism. I let Reggie was amazing. He was a, he was a pastor. He took, we go to the uh, uh, Pro Bowl in Hawaii and uh, he would have a revival and everyone was invited. And so he'd go down, and then he was like, who wants to be baptized? And the guys would raise, I will. And then they'd go out to the ocean and baptize all these pro bowlers. That's like, awesome. I love that. That's Reggie, awesome. man. That's awesome. Reggie. Steve, mid-90s, what was the team that you hated the most? Well, it, it was a love-hate because the, the Dallas Cowboys had become very quickly in the early 90s, like, amazing. Like, there was no weakness. They were, um, and they've, unfortunately for them, they've never seen close to that since, but. Uh, He's a massive Cowboys uh, fan, by the way. And well, no, but they, talk about underachievement to talent for 30 years. But that team, that team was some bad boys. And uh, anyway, the Cowboys were, were, we were the best and they were the best. And that's how, and I always felt like that's where you found out who you were. So in that way, I remember when Troy, I remember the Cowboys coming to play the candlestick, and I was, at, you know, you warm up at the fifty, and you go opposite ways, so you see each other, and I'm like, Troy, man, thanks for coming. You know, I'm on this quest to see how good I could get, and the only way I can see how good I could be is to play the best, and you guys are the best, so this is gonna be amazing. I almost hugged him because I was in this this space where I just I, I I wanted to find out, like I wanted to like how good could I be, and I remember Troy's like. Freaking weirdo! <laughs> <laughs> but there was that. But there was the uh, there was the hatred of it because they were so good that they got in the way. Like Super Bowls were, like the trophy is like, oh, and then it went there. You know, it was like one way or another, and that was super painful. So, I I mean, ninety two championship game against the Cowboys that we got beat. I still throw up in my mouth when I think about. That game, like that, like that's a, people say to me, what's the most memorable, th my most memorable thing is losing that game. Like you'd think it would be all the good stuff. Mm -hmm. And it was like, those were painful times. All right. Final three questions. Uh, let's go with which Super Bowl was the sweetest? Well, the one I started in was number one for sure. Cause I felt like we, I dragged myself there over many years and the awkwardness and the strangeness. And the, there was a, <laughs> the Gulf War in 1991 broke out in the Middle East. And, that, and uh, it was October and I was replacing Joe and it was, it was, it was awkward for the whole Bay Area, right? It was just odd and different and strange and everyone was struggling. And uh, the headline was the Gulf, this above the fold in the San Francisco Chronicle. You can go look it up at microfiche. Uh, the Gulf War, it's Steve Young's fault. <laughs> oh God. Because it was fun. They thought it would be funny. Like it was a funny thing, except it was, it was me. <laughs> like it wasn't funny to me. Uh, and so, um, yeah, there were, there were great times and hard times and it was amazing. Did you have time after you finished playing football where you had to kind of rediscover who you were because you had played, you had been football your whole life or were you pretty balanced? I mean, you went, you got, what got a law degree. I wasn't, I mean, I was, you were totally imbalanced because you had to give, pour yourself into something to be great or good or great. And you had to do it every day, all day. Like, that's all you did. And that way, um, you, balance is really hard to find. And I think that retiring was, like, amazing in some ways because you could now recognize that there's, like, s s wonderful things in your life that you didn't – that couldn't find a way in before. And um, – that struggle at all? Or was well, it – Yeah, I think, I think anyone who has a dream that actually comes true and they can actually perform, like – you know, you but jobs that quit at young ages, like you know, even acting. I think sometimes you can go a long time, but most of the time, is you get a, you get a star it goes and then it falls. And you know, sports is that way. Um, you can be great at something worldwide in a way, like one of the greatest, 
And then that's it. There's a day it just stops. And, uh, and the next day you wake up and you're like, wow, okay, that was amazing. I kind of want to keep doing that, but now it's over. And so the great thing I'm, I'm getting, the thing I'm best at, maybe I'll be the best at it my whole life ever is gone. And I'm actually looking forward and I'm not even good at anything else. And so it's a, there's a death. I always tell people when they're transitioning, it's a death, like treat it that way. Like it, it died and now you got to mourn it. And now you have to go through the pain of it all and all the 12 steps and, and come out and then say, okay, then what's the future? I'm going to go try to be great at something else. And I'm just going to, and my, my hero, Roger Schaubeck, I was asking for advice and he go, I said, I'm retiring. What should I do? He goes, run. I go, run where? He goes, just, I don't know, just run away. Cause the game will never leave you. They'll always want to ask you questions about it. Don't worry about it, but you need to run away from it because all, all you'll do is try to go back because it's such an allure because it was the time that you were the, the best. And uh, it's been great advice because despite the fact that my kids don't care, the only thing they care about is I'm number top five of Bobby Bones. <laughs> <laughs> like literally they talk about it all the time. Um, it's been a great advice because it is a death. And I, and I treat it that way. Like it died and it was amazing. And uh, now I got a different life. What's your favorite picture in your house that has nothing to do with sports? There's nothing. If you walked in my home, you would not know that it was my home. Uh, I didn't want to do that to the kids. They had enough problems at school and especially with my boys, you know, just Steve Young's kid. What do you, do you throw the ball? And like, no, I hate football. You know? Yeah. I like music theater. <laughs> you know, like it. So in our home, uh, nothing like that. Uh, we have, I guess we don't have a ton of art. We have a lot of transitional art, I'll call it. So like for Valentine's Day or Thanksgiving, we she draws a huge tree and then everyone has to write a th what they're thankful for and put it on the tree. Cool. So it's like that's the main thing in the house. And then there's the uh, – during um, – uh, Halloween, there's all the pictures from all the years of Halloween. They go up and then come down. So a lot of transitional art in our house. Um, uh, I th there, look, I, there, you know, there's, there's a little, a, a small picture of a great picture of Jesus that I love. That's like very, to me is very honest. That is up on the, on the, on the, uh, above the fireplace. It's just small, but just kind of reminder, that kind of thing. And our final experiment, uh, Mount Rushmore, four heads, musically, who do you put on that all time? <sighs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. I'm just going to go with, like, for, for me. Yeah, only for you. Yeah. It's only for you. It's your personal Mount right, Rushmore music. Right, All right. Um, st strangely Al Green. <laughs> um, uh, can I have Earth, Wind, and Fire, like the whole group? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, these are like some sort of like the, from the beginning. Um, I, I think, uh, uh, U2, like, well, I, I just, you know, I'm just like influence. Well, I think I've run out of places cause Bruce Springsteen has to be there as well, but now I have to have a space for Chris Stapleton. Like I just move, everyone move over. This this guy, <laughs> this guy needs a space. Can you we need, add a fifth? You need pause? a fifth head? You need like <laughs> a check. <laughs> yeah, but, but I think that I, I just... Dude is amazing, yeah. and I just I, I I one day I want to meet him. I want to meet him somehow. Oh, it's amazing. Uh, thanks for the time, really. Yeah. Like, no, this, you guys are the best. Yeah, we could have done this. For like eight, I would, I, I love this. I uh, now you're gonna have to come on my little podcast, and we're gonna talk about quarterbacking. How you do it? Uh, as what, in fourth grade when I was left-handed? <laughs> no. Oh, no, oh really? Once you yeah, start, got it, got once it, you got start it, yeah. thinking about it, <laughs> talk all about, about the that. metaphor. You'll be like, oh, I know how I. Anyway, want to want to yeah. If it's fair, I was going to say I quarterback until like tenth grade, just to kind of let. Then well, no, then I, I was know. A wide receiver, and I know you're not even talking it's about. Funny, like, you're talking about leading. It's funny. We, 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 last week we're like we're setting this up. Okay, yeah. when do you want to do it? And I'm like, oh, let's set it it's Wednesday. Let's do it early. Early's great. Okay, great. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, it's like, oh, by the way, here's a picture of me uh, high fiving Des Bryant and the game no, was straight. Not and then here's the MVP trophy. Not true. Like out of nowhere. This story like, has been fabricated. I didn't fabricated. say, hey, have you done no, no, anything no, no, great no. lately? No, 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 have no. You no. Had something That's not wonderful? what happened. It's like, I said, oh, how did you play? Just by the way, Steve, no. I just want you to know no. that I was MVP well, of no. the Somebody's charity lying. golf. No. Was it charity softball? No. It was not charity. First of all, I'm a little insulted. Second of all, sometimes I will fill in for Rich Eisen, who I, I, I I'll, come, I'll come to. You do yes. his thing? Yeah, I do. I fill, I do, I fill in for him. Yeah. 
And so I'll do his show when he's wow. gone. And I was going to do it this week, um, and I was not able to do it. And so I saw that you were on, and you were talking about playing at the golf tournament. Right, right, right. And so I messaged you and said, hey, how'd the golf tournament go? Because I have other friends that were playing. And you were like, ah. It's funny. I was just joking, and you got, you're a little defensive. <laughs> well, I'm, just, so I'm just very defensive right now. <laughs> and he's, he's like, I did blah, blah. And I was like, oh, cool. Well, oh, cool, cool. Listen, what I was you. doing. What? You're right. I, I, you, it wasn't out of nowhere. You're Thank right. You. I forgot. It was I only kind of out of nowhere. But I was like, look at my trophy. I'm also good at sports. <laughs> it was the belt, right? Yes, yes. It was a. It was Bell, and it said MVP. Pretty cool. And just I actually the second was a for little the, like wow. I yeah, wish you I were had stunned like that I'm an amazing <laughs> athlete. Now, to conclude, what it was the Major League Baseball All Star Game. Yeah, was, is happening. That's where that I was. was. Amazing. No, I know. <laughs> no, no, no. You said it was like a church league, yeah, like I, charity church <laughs> league, with fourteen year olds. Eddie, do you see this? I was just kidding. Very I insulting. live. I knew what I it was. I, knew what I just was having fun. Very insulting. You're an easy guy to tease. That's fun. Until we meet again, my friend. <laughs> Bobby, Thank you're you. great. Eddie. Awesome, Steve. You're Thank you best. so much. The hey. best, the best.